Okay, so let's think about where we are. Um, we've just been talking for a few days, slightly out of order, but we've been talking about why do we want to do inventories? Kind of what's, what's the science motivation? And then what data do we want to be recording when we're doing the inventories? So you go out and you spend a week at Corrup National Park, or you spend you know, a month at Corrup National Park, and you're doing your collections to document, but also your daily lists and things like that, so that you are working towards that inventory. Remember, inventory, not sample. Okay? If we wanted to do the sampling, if we, if we felt that our universe was too big to be able to do an inventory, then our, our methods would be different. So instead of, you know, Dave and Rafe and the rest of the HERP crew going out and using 10 different methods to try to get every species of herp that is detectable and, and that is active in the forest at that point in time. If we were in a sampling world, they'd be doing things more like you know, walking transects or um, turning over leaves and you know, the leaf litter in, in five meter squared blocks, you know, whatever. They'd be doing some systematic thing so that they could create a big population of samples, right? But instead, they're setting out to do an inventory. They want to know every name and then as much additional information as they could get. But really what they want to know is the full herpetofauna present at that place at that time. So we've got these data. And remember how we talked about, or I talked about, um, how sometimes the inventory motive takes you away from the detailed ecological information, like when we were talking about Moses' sampling. Um, if Moses were really, really setting out to get an exhaustive catalog of all the plant species present at that place at that time, then he probably wouldn't be spending all that time measuring and counting plants. So we've got these kind of simpler data that lack some of the detail, but again, we're working towards, if not getting the absolutely complete inventory, at the very least we want to know how complete is our inventory. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. So in theory, you would think this would be easy, right? Moses has been working with the plants of Corrup National Park for 18 years. Dave's been working in Central Africa for 15 years. Um, you'd think that these guys would be able just to walk into the forest. Yep, yep. And, you know, no, I'm not seeing this. Right? But, as you all know, it isn't easy, okay? Many sites on Earth have not been surveyed in detail, and many taxa are very hard to survey. So we'll talk, starting tomorrow, about the fact that, in fact, you have many species that aren't even known to science, okay? They have to, so for some groups, and herps, and and plants are actually the good examples. For some groups, you have to describe almost all the species before you can start saying, yes, I have an inventory. You have, you know, morphotype A, morphotype B, morphotype C, and you don't even have names for them. You know, if we were talking about some families of beetles, for example, there would be this huge job before you could say, yes, I'm doing an inventory. 
with herps, if they get a new species this trip, they'll probably be jumping up and down and celebrating. And that means they don't have many of those new species to describe. Perhaps even worse is uh, the biases and the errors that jump into this process. Uh, things like the spatial distribution of sampling, comparability of different units of effort, errors in taxonomy, etc. So it's not going to be easy. But if we were able to get really robust estimates of how complete our inventory is, it would really be a, a good help to our biodiversity science. So for example, imagine that um, the Minister of Natural Areas or you know, whatever the, the position is in your country calls up you or calls up your supervisor and says, we have the opportunity to create a new reserve. And we're interested in these sites and we understand that you have worked there. Can you please help us out with information about which of these sites is more important or um, what species are present at these sites? Oh, and that critically endangered species that's very poorly known, is that there? And all of a sudden you're thinking, hmm, I spent seven days at that site and it was raining the whole time and I really couldn't get out. Some of us don't like it when it rains the whole time. Um, and so you're thinking, wow, would I have detected that species? Or you're thinking, I only have 80 species on my list for that site. Is, that, is it really that poor? And so all of a sudden you're in this set of doubts because you don't really have anything that informs you about your inventory and how good or how bad it is. Okay? So we really do need that information. It's like the quality tag. It's like on the GPS readings. You know, you might get a very precise latitude and longitude, but the uncertainty may be ridiculously bad. Kind of like Dave's camera's um, estimate of where we are or where we were when he took that picture. So just to give you an illustration of some of the biases that come in, this is kind of a macro scale example. But uh, if you look at biodiversity sampling across landscapes, it ends up being very, very, very tightly tied to routes of access, okay? So Mexico is a very mountainous country. And in the 19th century, you can see essentially a road map defined by where people were collecting birds. But each of those kind of lines of, of sites, those were early roads. Okay, and essentially biodiversity sampling at most scales looks like this. Countries that are very accessible because of, you know, peaceful, stable government or being on shipping routes or travel routes or having major rivers or a good road system. Those countries get sampled intensively and countries that are in difficult political situations or that are extremely remote don't get sampled. And within countries you get road bias. And in fact, within a site you're going to get trail bias. Okay? Think about it this next week when you are moving around Corrup National Park you're going to be mainly in the, I think it's southwestern portion where chimpanzee camp is because you're not going to have the energy to walk to the other end of the park. You're going to be mainly moving around on the trails. 
And if the trails are situated in certain environments, then you will be sampling the off-trail environments less. And if one stream is right behind camp, that'll probably have a herpetologist in it every day. And if the other stream is a half hour's walk or three hours walk, it'll get sampled less. So right away you get these spatial biases. And if the spatial biases are at all uh, correlated with environment, en environmental variation, then you're going to be biased immediately in your sampling. Again, this is a coarse example, but here's a temporal bias. Okay, if you look at uh, the accumulation of Mexican bird specimens through time, in effect, before 1880, there's no sampling. And I assume that effect here is even stronger. And then look at this. This is a time when across Mexico you had a war going on, a civil war. And at the same time, the European and American collectors were preoccupied with a world war. And so you get almost no specimens in that period. After this big turn of the century pulse, you remember Nelson and Goldman. We looked at uh, Goldman's field notes. That's thanks to them. And then we kind of go into this, this big pulse. And then more recently it comes down partly because Mexico was being very strict about permitting, partly because maybe the ornithologists of the world were thinking that we were kind of done. Uh, many of us think that they were kind of wrong. So again, one of these general properties of biodiversity information is that most sites don't have any data. Okay? So this is the this, this same analysis of, of uh, Mexican bird sampling. The top panel is by block. Um, so essentially that is uh, pixels across Mexico, sorry, pixels across Mexico and how many records each one has and the frequency with which different pixels across Mexico have that number of records. So you can see there's one pixel that has 10,000 bird specimens from it. It's essentially a professional collector who went to one place, very famous place in southwestern Mexico, near Acapulco, way up in the mountains, very beautiful, and he would pay the little kids of the village, you know, a penny per bird that they brought in, and the little kids would go out with slingshots and collect birds for him. But then you see most of these sites, the largest number of sites has zero information, and most of the sites have very little information. Or we can look at sampling of species. Or we can look at numbers of specimens per species. And essentially we always see these J-shaped distributions where the mode of the distribution is either at or very near zero. Okay, which is to say for most of the entities in our collection, we don't know much. So we've got to Bear in mind, in our analysis, a bunch of things. Global biodiversity probably, global biodiversity probably is too big to inventory. And so we need to sample at that level. At finer levels, we may be able to do um, something that we could call an inventory. And we're usually aiming specifically at some quantity. And the most common quantity is number of species. And we really, ideally, will build from the bottom up. And this is, this is going back to yesterday's lecture about the difference between concentrated samples at single sites versus kind of spreading it around. If we are able to focus our, our efforts at single sites, we essentially use the power of our data more efficiently. Um, and then, 
If we do that at enough sites across a landscape, we can look at how local diversity translates into regional diversity. And essentially the difference between local and regional diversity is how much the set of species turns over between one place and the next. And that is what we call beta diversity. Everybody familiar with those concepts? Alpha, beta, gamma diversity? Yeah. So the local single site diversity is referred to as alpha diversity. But let's say we're talking about all of Cameroon. We're not imagining that all of the species present in Cameroon will be present at any one site within Cameroon. And so that global, in this case Cameroon-wide diversity, we refer to as gamma diversity. And that then brings you to some really interesting thinking points, which is how much, you know, if I, if I do a local site inventory here, and then I move one kilometer down the road, do I get the same result? Do I get the same set of species? This is what Dave was talking about with going back to a site, or no, was it, I guess it was Rafe was talking about this, sorry. Going back to a site, and you want to say as a biogeographer, it's the same mountain, but they went one stream drainage down the road. And they got a whole bunch of new species, like 60% species, 60 of the species that they got in the second inventory, they didn't get in the first, something like that. And if they'd gone another kilometer down the road and another, you'd be able to measure essentially how many species drop out and how many new species come in, right? That is beta diversity. That is the site-to-site -site component of diversity. But just think about it with me. That gets really interesting because if you do that sort of very detailed sampling across a landscape, many individual inventories, then what, and if you can you know, control for the seasonality effects and things like that that Rafe mentioned, you may be able to pick out important biogeographic breaks. For example, maybe when I'm in that higher, more continuous part of the Cameroon Mountains, maybe I go from site to site and there's not much change. But then I get to a deeper valley, maybe that goes down to 500 meters, and I see more species turning over across that valley, you know, between the highland areas on either side of that valley. Okay, so if you, can, if you could map beta diversity, then you would be able to um, essentially detect biogeographic barriers based on species composition. But that depends on having lots of those intensively sampled sites, those, those inventoried sites. Is that making sense to everybody? I'm not giving you an explicit definition of beta diversity in mathematical terms because there are like 20, okay? But we have a whole lecture on that from the past course, so we can link you up with a, a movie to watch about that. Okay, so now let's talk for a while about kind of the theory behind the sampling that we do 